Hi, it's Midnight Mule and today I thought I'd talk a little bit about employment and having Asperger's. Now I'm not sure that in today's video I'm going to have any useful advice for anyone. I'm not in a position to give advice. I thought all I can do is talk about some of my experiences and some of this may resonate with some of you and some of it may not. So the first thing is, look, I'm wearing a suit and a tie. Something annoying for Aspies is that neurotypicals first impressions are really important the way someone looks is really important to an aspie it, it really doesn't matter and it's really frustrating this whole first impressions thing so anyway back to the main thing uh three points to make to start with which has massively affected my employability i guess the first is i was very fortunate in that when i was growing up i saw my dad working very hard he was a farmer he had a very small farm and he'd be up early while it's still dark go off to the farm come back have his breakfast go back again and he would have worked seven days a week but my mum always made him take Wednesday afternoon off so I was brought up in an environment of you work it's just what you do I saw I saw my dad working and that's just what you do also I was brought up reading the bible we're uh, we're a Christian family and there's a bible verse I think it might be in two Thessalonians about if a man doesn't work he doesn't eat so again, it's just, you're expected to work. I'm fully aware some people are unable to work, but the expectations was, you work, and it's just what you do. The third thing, which also goes in my favor, is a lot of, it's not unusual for an Aspie to be naturally gifted at something. And I've always been good with numbers, since I can't remember when, so good I am with numbers. Um, numbers and sums and maths has just come easy to me i see patterns and i can work with numbers very easy so as an example silly example i think i was seven and i remember i was in the front room and i was looking in the back of the newspaper and there was some horse racing results there and i didn't know anything about horse racing but i understood that uh what the odds meant for the various horse races and i was wondering i wonder if it's possible to bet a certain amount on each horse so that whatever the outcome was, you'd make a profit. And I was seven, I didn't know any better. So I got out a piece of paper and a pencil and looked at two or three races and worked out different amounts to stake so that whatever the result, I'd always get the same return. And I found out that actually the bookie had like about a 5% advantage. So it wasn't possible. And of course, now that I'm older, I know, of course, the bookies have an advantage, but as a seven-year-old, I didn't. But the point was, there's be a lot of, people older than seven maybe wouldn't even think about doing that and if they did think about it they might not think how to work it out and having not been told I just saw the numbers thought well if I do this 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 I can work it out so numbers have always been easy so I consider myself to be very blessed that the thing that I'm good at is numbers some Aspies might be very good at art or music and they could be more talented with music than I am with numbers but the reality is there's more employment opportunities if you're good with numbers. So what I thought I'd do in this video, like I said, probably no advice for anyone. I just run through my experiences. There might be something for you. I'd run through and try and recall the various jobs that I remember having and throw in some Aspie elements as I remember them. Now, remember, I wasn't actually diagnosed till I was mid 40s. But being Asperger's, of course, Aspie things still came into play. So we used to get pocket money growing up. We'd get, uh, we'd be expected to do a little job at the weekend or something. And they were sometimes seemingly silly little jobs like <laughs> taking all the cutlery out of the drawer in the kitchen and then rearranging it and putting it back nicely. Little things like that. But I didn't mind doing that because it was arranging things. And maybe that's the first little Aspie thing. Just trying to arrange all the spoons and the forks and everything nicely. It just felt nicer. But that would be true for a lot of non Aspies as well. They just want it to be nice. Anyway, the first real job uh, at my dad's farm, I remember I was about seven. We used to work down there and I used to get a pound an hour. And back in the 70s, for a kid, that was pretty good money. And I know a pound an hour was actually pretty good back then. Uh, so we used to help collect the eggs. There was a poultry farm. And there's also some uh, cattle there as well. But something else I used to do is serve in the shop. And the shop was... There was a small room with eggs and people would buy half a dozen or a dozen or a tray of eggs. And there's 30 eggs on a tray. 
and there'd be eggs of maybe six different sizes. And we also had a freezer with some frozen chickens. They weren't our chickens, my dad was buying them in. So there was chickens of various prices and eggs, various amounts, various sizes. So all these different numbers going on. And we didn't have a cash register where you'd punch in the numbers, they'd give you money, it'd tell you the change. We had a wooden drawer and you'd slide open the drawer and get the change out and put their money in. And so I'd be about seven or eight serving. And at the time, this was in the south of England, it's on Thorny Island, for anyone who knows the south of England. And there were a lot of the Vietnamese, presumably because of the Vietnamese war, was stationed there on a military camp. And we'd suddenly get loads of them in several times a week. And there'd be like a whole queue of them wanting to get served. And whereas other people working at the farm might be jotting down on a piece of paper, working out they bought this, 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 and adding it up, I'd just be taking their orders, doing it in my head, getting the change, giving it to them next person. And I could serve people really quickly because I could just do the numbers in my head. And that was nice for them. And it was obviously nice for my dad that they could get served nice and quick. Something else related to that, but it's not a job. I remember when I was, it was probably before I was going to school, actually, I might, uh, my mum would go shopping in the local village and we'd go to maybe the chemist or the co-op. She'd buy it wasn't a cop. There's actually another. There's a small private grocery store, actually. She might buy five or ten items. She'd put them in the basket. And as she was doing that, I'd be adding it up. We'd get to the till and I'd say to the lady, oh, it's £3.72. And she'd smile and say, oh, yeah, we'll just check, shall we? And she'd spend a minute putting it all through. It wasn't... She had to type the numbers in. It wasn't barcodes. And be, oh, yeah, it's £3.72. And they always seem surprised. And I always, I was always surprised that they are surprised because it's like, well, all I'm doing is adding numbers. It's not rocket science here anyway so that was at my dad's farm and that's an nasty thing that came through when i was early teenagers teenager i had a paper round and again the attitude was you're supposed to work you just work i remember the very first day i was supposed to do this paper round the night before or the day before i twisted my ankle and it hurt to walk on so i phoned up the news agent and said look i can't i don't think i can do the paper round. she had to ride these heavy tradey bicycles and it was for a few miles I'd have to ride. I said, I've hurt my ankle, I can hardly walk. And he said, oh, I'll give you a lift then. So my very first day on the paper round, he gave me a lift in his car. And he st- and so I hobbled up to the first door and hobbled back. And he said, no, the best thing to do is just walk on it. If you've got a bad ankle, walk on it and use it. And something about Aspies, Aspies are very trusting. So I just thought, okay, that's what I've got to do. So I would then just go round and I was just, really, I guess, pushing my ankle on that first day of the paper round. And then after that, the way the paper rounds work, the uh, the addresses weren't written on the papers. You'd have a board with which address had which paper and a bag full of the papers. The bag was prepared for you. And obviously, after about two or three days of doing a paper round, I just knew the whole round. I just memorised it. And so I didn't have to look at the board anymore. I'd have to look to start with to see, is somebody on holiday? And if not, I'd just go off and do it. But I had other friends that would do a paper round and I can't think of any other friends apart from my brother that stuck to the paper round after a week or two because it's raining or it's cold or they're tired. They didn't want to do it anymore. Whereas I would just be like, oh, it's quarter past six where the time was. You need to get up, walk or run to the uh, paper shop, do the paper round and you just did it and then you came home. So ended up being seven days a week. I'd get up early and do the paper round. And the attitude was you just do it. Now, there are lots of non-Aspies that have also got the work attitude of you just do it. But I think for certain Aspies, it's just a lot easier to think this is the way it's supposed to be. Just do it. And even now when I work, it's very much, it's not that I particularly want to get up and go to work, but this is what I do. I get up, I go to work and I do it. And it's just jing, 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 just work it like that. Uh, So that was the, uh, we had a collection round as well. So there's the paper and then at the weekend, we'd go to people's houses, I'd have a leather bag with some money in, and we'd go and collect the money for the paper, for the papers to live in the last week, or if they'd been away the last two weeks. And again, because maths was very easy for me, I was always very quick, no need a calculator, just to say, you owe this much, they'd give me so much money, and I'd just quickly give them the change to go on to the next one. So that was, again, I'm just very fortunate that that's just what I was gifted with. For a year or two at the weekends, I worked on another farm. My dad died when I was 10. So when I was maybe mid-teens, about 14, 15, I worked on another farm for a weekend. And the working conditions there were actually really nasty. Uh, 
the whole cleanliness was a lot worse than my dad's farm. Even though they're both battery hens, and I think they're probably banned now, it was still really quite nasty. So because of my sensory perception issues, that affected me quite a lot and was that was one of the worst places I think I'd worked. After that, again at the weekend, I worked at a hospital as a cleaner, which uh, it was a job. And because it was the weekend, we got paid twice as much, I think it was, maybe time and a half of the people during the week. You just had to go there. I think we had to be there for eight o'clock and you'd be cleaning up on the ward, for example, and then cleaning up the toilets. But the thing is, this was a, a home for people with, I can't think of the polite term now, um, certain mental disabilities, I guess you'd say. We, we always knew it, knew it as a funny farm. So a lot of the residents there on some of the wards wouldn't necessarily make it to the toilet or even bother using the toilet. So I might have to, they had a corridor, somebody might have gone to the toilet in the corridor and then I might get a call, oh, can you go and clean up this in the corridor? So I'd go and clean it up, but I didn't really think anything of it. Whereas other people, they were like, oh, that's gross. I was just, well, you just do it. And so it wasn't a particularly gross thing. It's just what I did. Now, what was interesting is, as far as I'm concerned, because of the people that were in the hospital, they would say things that were outrageous, but they'd say it with a deadpan straight face because they believed it. And so I used to talk to them. And so I learned a lot of my a lot of my uh, human interaction skills, I guess you could say, is because I used to speak to these people on the funny farm. So they would talk to me, for example, and they'd say about how they used to live on the moon. And so completely deadpan face back, I'd ask them about their life on the moon. And we could just talk about really crazy things, but they absolutely believed it. And I was just going along with it. But I learned to kind of talk about anything, but try and give off the right expressions. I don't know if I managed it or not, but they enjoyed speaking to me and I didn't mind speaking to them. In the summer holidays at school, I'd sometimes get a summer job. I remember one time I worked on a tomato farm with a friend, so I'd cycle, it was about three miles away the farm, had to get there, get there quite early and pick a load of tomatoes. You come back smelling of tomatoes, wasn't a pleasant job, but it's a job, you go there, you do it, and it's the money, and that's that. There was one summer, I think it was, I think it was the year after I'd done my O-levels, and I thought I could do with a summer job, and I wasn't just waiting for people to offer a job, I thought I'm going to try and find a job, so myself and a friend cycled to a, an airfield where it, it used to be an airfield but now it's just a few industrial units there I think it was 14 miles away so we cycled there and um, we just went up to one of the units hi looking for work you got any work no okay and just went to the next one and then he managed to get a job a place that was working wood I think they were no a place that was working metal but they only had space for one job so I went to some other ones and I found somebody that was working wood they made fences and cutting wood and this sort of thing so they offered me they said i could work there i think it might have been two pound an hour or something so what i'd do i'd cycle there 14 miles i think i had to be there for eight and i'd work till four half four and cycle 14 miles back home and again it was just the attitude of it's what you do you get up you go there you work now i was quite a scrawny teenager and that's the only job i remember getting dismissed from it wasn't a nasty dismissal the guy felt bad about it but I just wasn't bulky enough and strong enough to dig holes to put the fences in I could do some of the jobs like clearing out the sawdust and dipping fences and stuff but I wasn't quite good enough for him so he still paid me so he said oh look I'm ready so I'm gonna have to let you go you're not strong enough. I said oh no that's fine no problem so I think that was probably on a Friday and by then my friend had finished working the other place so on the Friday, he said, he sacked me basically. He said, okay, thank you. He gave me the money. I then just walked to the other place where my friend used to work that was doing metal. I said, oh, hi, I'm available to work. Do you want me to work here? And they said, oh, yeah, that'd be good. You want to come here Monday? So then for the next few weeks, I was cycling 14 miles there. And the metal work was actually easier because you had lathes and various other tools. And you just did what you're supposed to. Something I remember from there, which is, again, maybe part of the whole Aspie thing of you just do what you're supposed to do. There were safety notices up, I guess, for legal reasons, saying wear these goggles, wear these gloves and all the different safety equipment. And none of the guys there did it, of course. They just, you just didn't bother. But I did. It said it on the sign, so I'd wear the equipment. 
And by chance, one day when I was there, they had a random safety inspection and the guy came round and saw me wearing all the gear and just doing it properly. And so when the safety guy left, the boss came up to me and said, you just did us a real favour there because you were doing everything properly and that, that actually worked really well for us because it's a random inspection. So that was nice. It was, it was nice to think I was appreciated there. I did, there was one year, maybe two years, I did go to an agency and just said, look, you got anything going, I'll do it. So I worked at Electronics Place one time. They, I think I was testing different parts, just doing some naughty thing. It's just very, very basic. Another thing I had to do one day was help to dig some roads. Because like I said, I'd just do anything. I wasn't, it's not that I was desperate for money. A bit of money's nice, but you're supposed to work, so you work. And I remember there was this guy I was working with. He'd been doing it for like 40 years. And he had a, there's a circular saw because you're going to saw the pavement and then there'd be about maybe a one and a half, two foot gap and you'd saw the pavement the other side and then you'd have to dig it up. And so what he would do, he'd, I think he had a spray can, he'd spray this long distance and then he'd measure out carefully 18 inches, whatever it was, at various points and then he'd spray the other side and there were the two lines you had to cut. It didn't have to be exactly straight but they had to be basically parallel so it would take a while to mark it all out and then I'd go there and cut it and I said to him there's actually an easier way than this and I could just see it and he said go on then show me so I cut the line and then there was a I think there was a piece of metal or there was something on this cutter I said look that distance from there to there is about 18 inches so I just line that up with the line I've just cut and I just cut back and he was just like, I never thought of that. I've been doing it for years and that's so much quicker. And I was only on there. They only needed me for one day and I did it for a day. But it's just, I guess, because I very easily see patterns. I can very easily see there's a problem. There's a solution. Why don't you just do that? And that's, that does cause problems because it can cause resentment if someone's been doing something for a long time or they've come up with a solution and I can just see something that's potentially better. Some people are very good with it and they just want the best solution. Others, I would say, have an issue with pride and it can hurt their feelings if you point out something that might be a bit better than that. Uh, there was a, another summer, my stepdad, he worked at an electronics testing place. So after my A-levels, I got a summer job there. I had a car by then. Yeah, I think I had a car, I had a car so I could drive there. Did I? No, I didn't. I got a lift in. Sorry, I got a lift in. He used to leave quite early. It was probably about half six he'd leave for work, I guess. And so to start with, I was just doing some tests on some microchips. We have certain tests, write down the parameters, do whatever the results were. And I was only doing that for probably a couple of weeks before they noticed that when I was on a computer, I was using the computer quite well. It was a Unix system. I didn't know much about computers, but it wasn't difficult. It was just logical. And so they wanted me to do something a bit different. There was, they needed somebody to print out the results. Now in those days, the printers were dot matrix printers, which for those that don't know, it's, it's a really slow process. Had all these little pins on a printer and it'd go all the way across and all the way back. And so to print a page would take quite a few seconds because to print a line would be several seconds and there's several lines on a page. And there'd be, what happened, there'd be hundreds of chips were tested and then they'd have to print out all the results, which would be like a box of paper, which would take a very long time to print out. And some of the chips would be failures. So if a chip failed, they would keep retesting it and retesting it until it passed. And as long as it passed at one point, it was counted as a pass. And then they would get a pair of scissors. And so my job was to print all these out and go through it line by line find ones that failed, cut out all the failed results for that. So it was just the pass that was left. And it, it was legal because it just had to show oh, it passed at one point. Sometimes you have a chip that would always fail. So I just leave the latest failure in there. And because it was such a slow process, not only printing it and then also manually going through it, checking every single line, it, they're actually getting about a box a week. So before I started doing the job, they were getting about one box a week of these results. And the problem they had was they were testing them much quicker than they were producing the results. So then that was my job. And I was just thinking, well, this is stupid. There must be a better way. 
and I saw there was a manual there to do with the scripting language on the Unix box. So I thought, I'll just look at this. So I read that and then I wrote a script so that rather than me going through and reading it, this script would go through and it would look for the failures. And then if the other last one was a pass, it would get rid of all the failures and then leave the pass. Or if it was a failure, it would just leave the last failure. But then it would alert me to where the failures were. And then this program, all I had to do was print it because it was already edited. So that was all, that was great. So they were as pleased as punch because what happened where they were getting one box a week when before they put me on it and they first put me on it, I then upped it to giving them a box a day. So I made it five times as fast. So they're really, really happy. What they didn't know was sometimes I'd be out the night before and I'd be drinking quite a bit. And some days I'd go in there and I'd just be feeling really hungover and not really right to work. And other days I'd be reading this Unix book trying to learn new things and make things better for myself. I was actually producing 10 boxes a week, or I could produce 10 boxes a week. That was my rate. So what I did, I'd always have a few boxes in reserve so that if I had a day I went in there and I just couldn't work, I'd be in there, I'd maybe teach myself a bit of script, maybe have a coffee, or no, I wasn't having coffee, just drinking water, feeling a bit rough. At the end of the day, I'd take him a box. So they were still very happy, but not knowing I was actually working quicker than they realized, but I was compensating for the fact that I knew I could do a bit better. And then I, I had several jobs at that place. They then moved me from that. They needed some to help out with their databases they were working on. This was for ESA, European Space Agency. They were doing some uh, a procurement program for ESA. I'd never done anything with database, didn't know anything about the programming language, but I picked up really quick and I was helping with that for a few weeks. And after a few weeks of that, the guy who was running the computer department for this company, he then poached me and wanted me helping him out. And that was fine. And he was a French man. I liked him a lot. He was, other people found him very arrogant and grumpy, but because I'm Aspie, I just go by the words that are actually said. So I really liked him and he seemed to really like me. So that was, that was all very good. And then I did a degree. I did electronics degree. And then at the end of the degree, the last, couple of months, maybe the last few weeks, people on the degree course would then be out job hunting. And I didn't actually need to do any job hunting because the electronics place I'd worked at this testing house, they wanted me to go back there and work for them doing whatever it was. But somebody else, another company, can't remember how they'd heard about me, they wanted me to work for them as well. But then the dean of the faculty at the university, he'd seen my work and he wanted me to stay on and work for him. So without even looking for work, I was very blessed just because I'm naturally good at numbers and maths and logic. I had three job offers without trying. So the postgraduate work was he wanted me to do uh, research. I'd have to write papers, I'd have to do a PhD. And but you normally get a you normally get hardly any money, you maybe get a bursary or something. I said, look, I got some job offers here. I only work for you at the university if I'm getting a proper salary. And I said, this is how much the other places are offering me. If you give me that much, then I'll work for you instead, which he agreed to do, so that was great. So I worked at the university for, I think three years I was working there. So I had to write various papers. I I did the master's side of the, I did the master's, and then from that, I then moved on to the PhD, did all the work for the PhD, but there was a company in Edinburgh, this is, where are we now, early, mid nineties, early to mid nineties, and they were doing work with internets and web pages and that seemed an awful lot more interesting than the research I was doing. So I thought, well, and they, for a few years, they've been wanting me to go up and work for them. And my brother lived in Edinburgh at the time and we really liked Edinburgh, I was married by now. So I thought, well, I've done all the work I need to do for the research, all I've got to do is write it up now. So I'm now gonna to move to Edinburgh and do this fun thing working with computers. So I did move to Edinburgh, but Predictably, I never actually got around to writing up my thesis. I never actually got my PhD in the end. But it was a quite an intense place to work. Again, being Aspie, I picked things up very quickly. I worked very hard and uh, the staff weren't always getting paid there. And it got to the point where my wife and I were putting things on our credit card, just day to day living because we weren't getting paid. But my attitude was I got to work. So I was working long hours working weekends as well and not getting paid for it and I just got completely burnt out so that was a very bad thing and at the time 
I was working on an intranet for a particular company and I was doing all the work for it. So I designed the database, I was building all the front end pages for it. And the company I was working for that was employing me ran into trouble and we weren't getting paid, like I said. And so it was the case that this internet's not going to get finished. It was about two thirds finished. So this client said to me, look, can you finish it for us? If we make a deal with the company, we we just pay you and you finish it yourself. And for a few years, I'd fancied having my own company running my own little business. So I said, well, yeah, OK, but I want to make a limited company first because I wanted to have limited liability. So I made a company and then I finished the internet for them and obviously they're very pleased with it and everything. And then the company I had, I'd have different people coming to me asking for websites or intranets or this, that and the other. I learned a lot about business. I learned a lot about the sort of clients you shouldn't be getting. And if I could have my time again of running my own business, I would run it an awful lot better than I did. So I made plenty of mistakes in that business, but we always paid all the staff every month. And at the peak, I think we had 12 full-time staff and two part-time. So uh, although I didn't get paid every month, the other staff did get paid. So I was always quite pleased about that. But then this client that I built the internet for, they're always one of our main clients. One year, the CEO who used to come up to Edinburgh to see us maybe three times a year, said that he decided to, they decided to take the whole IT uh, function in-house at the time we were doing IT support and all the development. And I said, yeah, well, I'm not surprised. So uh, take it in-house, make sense. You're going to save some money. And then he said, we want you to head it up. So it's like, oh, I had my own company with a number of staff. And now he wanted me to move down to Cheshire. And it's like, OK. So I was paying myself a certain amount of money when I got paid. So I said, OK, but I want to get paid X. And I like, I asked for a lot more than I was getting paid. And he reduced the number slightly and said, I was thinking of this number. So I said, I'll talk to my wife. So I said to my wife, do you want to move to Cheshire? She's like, oh, yeah, that'd be good. So fine. So we moved down to Cheshire. It was about a year later, it took me about a year to sort things out in the business. And I had someone else trying to run the business, but it only lasted another year before it shut. But part of that was, I think, I was clearly one of the main dri driving forces in the business. So since 2012, I've been working in my current place of employment. And I'm still, alarm goes off early. And I leave home at half six to get to work for seven because there's less traffic then. And I'll leave work about quarter to four, maybe, again, to try and miss the traffic. There are several Aspie things I could talk about at work. So, OK, while I'm at while I was at this job, my current employment, that's when I got diagnosed. And so on the back of that, we then had a meeting and with what was the HR department to see if there's anything we need to be done, what can be done. So all I said was, look, interruptions really affect me because they do. If I'm trying to concentrate on a piece of code or designing something and someone just pops in to say, hi, how are you doing? maybe a bit of small talk or, oh, sorry to interrupt, can I just ask so-and-so? That throws me and that can actually cost me a lot of time because I had so much going on in my head. So one thing we agreed was I'd get my own office, which I had anyway, but I'll always be allowed my own office. And there's a sign on the door that says, do not disturb. And then the other thing I had changed in my contract was I could do whatever hours I want. As long as I do the right number of hours per week, I'm on like Uber flexi time. So my official hours were nine to five. But the trouble with that is there's a lot of traffic. So I ended up leaving earlier and earlier to make sure I was definitely in work long before nine. So I think my first day I was probably in about half past eight. And I kept creeping earlier and earlier because what if something does happen? I ended up being at work at seven, but it meant the traffic was a lot sweeter. So I had my contract changed to say, look, I can just, as long as I do the right hours in the week, it's okay. So that's why I'm working at the moment. It's okay. Uh, I don't think I'm used to my full potential there. The When I was taken down there, there were certain people on the executive and they all knew me. They worked with me for like 10 years or more. But within the space of about a year, nearly, nearly the whole exec was replaced because they retired. The new exec didn't know me. And as with a lot of Aspies, I can come across as very arrogant and sure of myself, I guess. But us Aspies don't see it that way. We don't see it as boastful. We're just saying matter of fact things. And I kind of, I think, got pushed in a bit of a corner. 
So now what I'm doing is business intelligence, working with databases, making sure reports and numbers are right. And if there's issues, I find out potentially where problems might be occurring. I think I might talk about that in another video. So that was a quick ramble through uh, my employment history. I know I didn't give any advice there at all to do what is and isn't helpful, but there may be something there that resonates with you or it may just be interesting to know. I can definitely say there would be some Aspies out there that will make excellent staff. If you want them, if you're an employer and you want someone who's going to be very logical or good with numbers or honest, that's something else that is a plus and a minus depending on who you talk to. Aspies can certainly tick some of those boxes, not all Aspies, and there are non-Aspies that can also do that. But if you give an Aspie the right working conditions, they can make excellent staff, in my very biased opinion. But I also think the track record says that as well. Okay, I think that's about it. I hope there's something useful there for some of you. Thanks. Bye.